If you want to do anything in psychology, you've got to follow the experimental method. There are three things that make psychology difficult to study. We're complex, we're like onions, not because we're big orange and round, but because we've got layers, levels of complexity. The human brain is complex and mysterious. There's a lot of variability in people. We are variable between ourselves from day to day, and we're variable from one another. Every one of us is a person, but we're diverse, and that's what makes us so remarkable. Take variability, mix it with complexity, and then meet another psychology. Here is an example of two swans in the wild. They got into a fight. They got tangled up in desperation. They actually swim over to this human being to get untangled. And they're being so patient, which is amazing for an animal known for its ability to break a human leg with a wing. And they he's almost got them untangled. It's got a happy ending. And so close. He's almost got them. It's can he do it? How did they do this? And he's free. Whew. Steps in the method. Look around the world. Ask questions. What could be the cause? Design an experiment to find out. Test those results. Get a conclusion. You're probably wrong. Do it again. Hey, Stanley Milgram's authority study was simply an attempt to find out how the Nazis could do what they did during World War II. Let's ask a question. What is happiness? What is happiness? We know it's a feeling of contentment and satisfaction, but let's take a look and see what animals and people look like when they're happy. Look at that face. That is a happy face. We figure out a definition of happiness, feeling contented and satisfied. We've looked around the world and seen what people look like when they are happy and satisfied. Now we need to come up with an operational definition, a way that we can concretely measure happiness. In order to do that, we're going to create an operational definition. Let's say you're baking a cake. If you want somebody else to be able to bake your identical cake, you need to give them the ingredients and the procedure by which you made the cake. So an operational definition is a scientific way of saying, hey, these are the ingredients and my recipe. If we think smiling can be measured by muscle movements of the face, we can use EMG to measure those muscle movements by placing electrodes where people smile. Am I really saying I want to define happiness by how much somebody smiles? Well, if happiness is feeling contented, and people contract the muscles around their mouth and their eye when they feel contented, when they smile, and we can see that by measuring EMG, then yeah. But you might ask, what about fake smiles? What does that look like? Well, let's take a look in more detail. Let's take a look at the muscles involved in real smiling and fake smiling. There are four major groups and a bunch of minor groups. The ubicularis oculi contracts the muscles around the eye. The zygomasticus pulls the lips up towards the cheeks. The obicularis oris contracts the mouth. And the occipital frontalis and procerus lift the eyebrows and forehead. So here are our four groups overlaid. Here I am contracting the orbitalis, and you can see that it clenches the eye down. This is a circular muscle just circling the eye, and now I'm just going to contract the eyelid part of the orbitalis. My eyelids are a little twitchy there. Now I'm going to contract the inside of the frontalis. It's actually called the procerus. Watch the inside of my eyebrow lift. Here we are, that's the procerus lifting. And now, we're going to look at the frontalis. Now watch the outside of my eyebrows, there we go, as they lift. So the frontalis will pull them more outward. Now, this muscle goes along the nose, and it's going to contract it up. Um, 
They call this motion the Elvis. This first one's not so hot, you'll see it better in a minute. Next, this is the Aurus, and it's going to contract the mouth into the Zoolander. So a little purse lips there as these contract. If you take the Aurus and contract it along with the Zygomasticus, we're going to get a smile. Here we are at the lower Zygomasticus, and in a minute in the superior. Notice that in the superior, that it actually quirks the lip closer towards in the direction of the eye. Now I'm going to go through and I'm going to pull each of the muscles along the side. Here's the lowest. This one's a little hard to do. Ah, there we go. Got it that time. Pull in the lowest muscle. Watch the angle of the mouth. Next up, a little bit higher. Moving up yet a little farther. Into the zygomasticus. Quirking it up. Now we're starting to get into an area where we're going to have wrinkling around the eyes as we get these higher regions. Moving upward. This muscle is the Stallone. It lifts the outer layer of the eyes. And the inner one, the one that runs along the nose, um, I'm informed that exercise scientists refer to this as the Elvis. And so I like to pair it, the Elvis on the inside, the Stallone on the outside. Now this group of muscles on the outside of the eye has two different functions. It can pull the outside of the forehead up a little, and it can also pull the outside of the eye towards the hairline. So let's take a look at a genuine smile and how these different muscle groups are involved. So we have some wrinkling around the eye as the orbitalis contracts. You can see that both the orus and the zygomasticus are contracting both groups of those muscles. In the fake smile, in the disingenuous smile, you can see that the orbitalis is relaxed and there's no squint around the eye. At the level of the cheek, the lower portion of the zygomasticus is pulling a little bit, but the upper regions, the elvis um, and the stallone aren't involved at all. And so the bottom part of the cheek actually looks a little flaccid. When you get to the mouth, you can see if you follow along the line of the lip, the outer edge of the lip actually quirks down a little bit. and you can see that muscles even below the zygomasticus are being involved. You can see that there's a flat line at the middle of the lip as well because it's not being pulled upward and that the depressor, this unusual muscle here at the side of the mouth, is actually pulling the mouth down a little bit. So there you've got a real smile and not so much. So this is a pretty good measure of smiling. If, in fact, EMG is an unbiased, powerful way to measure a smile, and a smile predicts happiness, we have a good measure of happiness, and we're ready to conduct a study.